Hello, and welcome to the Hogan Cast, a weekly podcast where we discuss a variety of subjects. Each week, we talk about a different topic, from literature to travel and everything in between. Our episodes strive to be both conversational and informational, and our occasional interviews are hopefully entertaining. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy this week's episode. Hey, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Hogan Cast. It has been a while again. I think uh, it's been at least a couple weeks. I guess I need to change, you know, from weekly update to intermittent updates, I suppose, because I definitely haven't been keeping up with the weekly update every a new topic every week. So I apologize for that. I'll try to do a better job in the future, but no guarantees because I get busy. You know, there are a lot of things that I have to do every day. I have to wake up, go to work, and then on the weekend in my free time, I kind of like to play video games. So the podcast is something I really enjoy doing, but it's also kind of a hobby. It's not bringing me any money in yet, unfortunately. So maybe once this becomes my primary source of income, I'll be better on the weekly update thing. But for now, I'll do my best to do weekly updates, but it is what it is. So what have I been doing since the last update? Like I said, a lot of stuff. Just today, I, I've been playing pretty much Elden Ring all day. So those of you that are playing Elden Ring probably know what I'm talking about. It's a pretty addictive game. But going forward, we're going to try to work this thing out. So I got a screwdriver here. I'm sitting sat down at my computer and I am ready to do I believe the seventh episode of the podcast so a lot of you probably don't know and given the production value of this podcast you you may be surprised to learn that I'm actually pursuing a master's degree in mass communications and I'm almost done but during one of the during my class this semester one of the assignments we looked at some campaigns from Mississippi and Mississippi you know has a lot of uh, negative stereotypes associated with it. It's it's often at the bottom of education lists or financial earnings list or, you know, opinion lists, whatever, whatever. Mississippi is usually either at the bottom or near the bottom, which is pretty similar to uh, my home state as well. West Virginia is kind of like that. This Mississippi campaign, it was called Mississippi Believe It. I believe it's still going on. And it's kind of funny. What they do is they they actually use the stereotypes and they make fun of themselves to raise awareness or, or kind of try to improve their image. So like, for example, yes, we can read. A few of us can even write. And then they'll give a list of a few famous authors from Mississippi. And a lot of them are, are pretty similar to that they they go into the blues you know the music history the sports people from there like brett Favre and things like that it's a really uh interesting campaign i don't know how successful it was because you know mississippi is still at the bottom of those lists but it kind of made me think that west virginia needs something like that so as you probably know west virginia has quite a few quite a lot of negative sto- stereotypes associated with it uh, we talked about a lot of those in the first episode were uneducated toothless, barefoot, pregnant, inbred, whatever stereotype that you can think of that's been leveled against my state, pretty much all of them. Another thing we kind of talked about is for for this mass comm degree, I have to do a final project. And right now my final project has is uh, how could West Virginia improve tourism to kind of offset those coal mining jobs that were lost. But in doing research in preparation for that final project, I've found a lot of like really interesting, well, interesting to me, maybe to you, interesting studies and statistics on the state. And I kind of just want to get into those for a minute and then move on from there. But one study I saw is really interesting because West Virginia is, it's kind of unique because you have the Southern Coal Belt like the southern part of the state, most of the coal fields were, and the people are have a lot of cultural ties to the south, you know, to Kentucky, Virginia. They're, they're very similar to those states. But then if you go up to the northern panhandle, like where West Virginia University is in Morgantown, they, you know, they're close to Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania. So they have a lot of those kind of cultural ties there. And then where I'm living now in the eastern panhandle where Harper's Ferry is and Martinsburg and and, uh, Charlestown, it's kind of close to northern Virginia. Like, you know, the people are, it's, it's a lot more diverse up here for one. The people 
have more of a Virginia accent than what you would think would be a West Virginia accent or, you know, a Southern West Virginia accent. So it's unique in that way. And, and one of these studies looked at why are, why are all these young students leaving West Virginia? You know, why aren't they staying to try to improve the state? Why do they want to get out so bad? Because that's been proven that like the kids that are going to college and are going to get good jobs, engineering jobs, doctors, whatever, a lot of them leave the state and they decide to leave the state usually in high school. And what they found is in the Southern part of the state, the reason for leaving is number one, they're, they don't think there's going to be jobs that they can have. They, they don't think that, well, when there was coal mining, it was either, they knew they either have to work in the mines or they wouldn't make any money pretty much. Um, now that there's not coal mines, it's just pretty much they, they don't see any good job opportunities in the Southern part of the state. And that, that's, it's not 100% true, but, but I can kind of see where they're coming from, especially in a high school. And another thing they saw is that there's this, it's almost like a shame of the stereotypes associated with the state like what outsiders think of them. And so they kind of want to get away from that stigma or stereotype. And then in the northern and northeastern part of the state, it's it's kind of similar. They're, they don't think that there are a lot of good jobs, but they're actually ashamed of the people in the southern part of the state who they look at as all the stereotypes that people label to the whole state. They label just the southern part of the state. And, you know, they think that those people are bringing them down or whatnot. So like this divide within the state, three different groups of people, three different regions with very different thoughts on the state and, and their view of the state and the view of the other people in the state. Because in the South, they, they kind of, they don't really view them as being really West Virginians. They view them, like I said, more, you know, Pennsylvanians or Northern Virginians. So you have like these three different groups or, well, three main ones. And they all have different ideas about one another. So that, that was a pretty interesting study. And another thing I found is for West Virginia, if you look at those stereotypes that are associated with the state, like, you know, the hillbilly, the, the mountain man doesn't know, isn't educated, doesn't really, shouldn't really have a voice because he has a lack of intelligence. That's a, that's a stereotype, I think, that persists today. And I don't think anybody would feel comfortable applying that stereotype to any other group of people other than Appalachian people. I think a lot of people say Appalachian people are the last group of people that are still okay to stereotype or make fun of. And I think to a certain extent that's true. But if you look at the history of where a lot of those stereotypes came from, because I'm not going to say that there's nobody in the state that can live up to those stereotypes, because there certainly are. But a lot of those stereotypes kind of started, there was a comic strip, first of all, called Little Abner, which was like kind of like a, a real hillbilly comic strip. So some of those stereotypes came from there. But then they were kind of perpetuated by the coal barons and, and those who were in control of the industry in the state so that any time people spoke up against them, they could say, oh, you know, those hillbillies, they don't know what they're talking about. We know what's best for the state. We're these rich coal barons, these rich businessmen. They're just mountain men with no shoes and no teeth. So that was kind of perpetuated. It even went so far as Lyndon Johnson ran his uh, war on poverty. And one of the main areas of focus was Appalachia. All the pictures, I think there was a Time Life magazine that came out in 66 or 67. It was all these pictures of people from Appalachia and, and like the poorest people from Appalachia, you know, just pitiful looking, no running water, not clean, the most stereotyped hillbilly you could imagine that was on the cover of time. And that has stuck with the state, I think, since then. Like people think the entire state is that way. And, and like I said, there's not to say that there's no one in the state even today like that, because there are, there are people like that. I, I grew up knowing people who would fit right in on that time life cover, but the entire state's not like that. But that stigma that stereotype has stuck with us and, and a lot of people trace that back to the war on poverty that's why i think that this mississippi believe it campaign even though i didn't really think it was super effective i i still think it would be a good idea because what mississippi did um is they ran it internally first because they felt like how can you try to convince people to come visit your state and be interested in your state if the people in the state aren't proud of it because they were running with a lot of the same problems that we are now that some of their own residents are, are ashamed of the state you know and mississippi has a different history it's a, it's a more uh racist history west virginia 
has a little bit of that uh, in the in the late twenties when the Ku Klux Klan came in to the state. Prior to that, we were pretty not that we weren't a diverse state, obviously, but we weren't really known for any type of racial issues. But then the Klan came in in the late twenties, early thirties, I think, and kind of established itself here for a, a couple of decades. And there were some racial issues here, but not on the not to the extent. Of Mississippi that I won't say that there were no racial problems because there were we had Jim Crow laws just like a lot of the other southern states uh, especially in the southern part of the state but not to the extent the Mississippi have a lot of, had a lot of our or a lot of our stereotypes are related like I said to to a lack of education or, or poverty incest seems to be uh, a really inter- uh, really popular stereotype to level against West Virginia. I don't know how many times uh, when somebody asked me where I'm from and I said West Virginia that there was some type of um, incestuous joke very soon after. So that, that seems to be a popular one. What I'm saying is that campaign by Mississippi, the Mississippi Believe It campaign, it was originally internally, it was a local PR firm. How it happened was the guy was on the plane and this kid asked him where he's from. He said, Mississippi. And the kids say, oh, do you do you hate all black people? You guys have running water, you know, whatever stereotypes. And this kid was from like Connecticut. And the guy was shocked that like person from the Northeast would, you know, have all these stereotypes still associated with Mississippi all these years after, you know, segregation or desegregation and everything like that. So he decided to start this campaign. And I think that that would work well in West Virginia, because like I said early, like one of the main issues with keeping people in the state is that number one there's no job opportunities but according to these surveys and i don't doubt them a lot of people are kind of uh, embarrassed of the stereotypes associated with the state and they they want to move on they want to get out so they're not associated with those stereotypes anymore and you know that's hard to say but uh, i don't doubt it especially for high school kids where well, i can't get a job and people think you know i'm i'm a hillbilly i, I don't have any teeth and dating my sister i'm not gonna live here so i i understand it's it's a uh, This is a difficult thing. So I think uh, an internal public relations campaign where we promote the the best that we've offered over the years, so highlighting the successful West Virginians. There's a few. Obviously, Chuck Yeager, the man who broke the sound barrier. Don Knotts is Barney Fife from Andy Griffith's show. I think Gilligan was from West Virginia. Steve Harvey is from here. He's from Welch. So if you like Family Feud, Steve Harvey's originally from here. Jerry West, obviously, Mr. Logo, NBA. Randy Moss is from here. I mean, there's a lot of pretty famous West Virginians. I think Pearl S. Buck maybe is from here as well. There's a lot of people we could kind of point to to say we're not all a bunch of hillbillies or anything like that. And I think a campaign like that would work well. And another thing, I think, as we kind of get into the 21st century, I think a lot of the pockets of like really really Appalachian people have kind of died out and you don't for the most part you don't hear that really thick West Virginia accent anymore I mean if you're listening to this and you're not from the south or you're not from West Virginia you can probably hear that I have a little bit of an accent particularly on some words but when I was growing up people had very 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 thick West Virginia accents and they used words that didn't make any sense there's one word in particular poke and I just thought it was some made up order. Poke is a bag. You can get a poke of tobacco or, or get go to the store and grab me a poke or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's like a bag of something. And I just thought it was some Appalachian nonsense word for years. And I went to Thailand and I happened to be working with this uh, Irish teacher named David Gallagher. He sometimes asked to be interviewed on the show. I'll try to get him on. He's a really interesting character. He told me that, no, it's not, it's not just a made up word. It's a Celtic word. You know, it means the same thing. It means bag, unless he lied to me, which is possible too. And that was really cool because, you know, we always been told in school that we were the last holdout of these languages and, and the Queen's English, like our accent was closer to like the English accent years ago that all these linguists came and studied and said that this hillbilly accent was actually really close to like the Elizabethan accent. We heard that for years growing up, I guess, to make us not feel ashamed. To hear that that really was like a an old Celtic or Gaelic word, I shouldn't say Celtic, Gaelic word, was kind of cool. It, it verified some things. And there's some other really interesting Appalachian phraseology. Like if something's gommed, that wall right there is gommed up or, or that shelf is gommed up. It just means it's completely messed up. It's crooked or, or, you know, whatever. It just looks like crap. A lot of times people will use conjunctions that don't exist. Like instead of saying like that is yours, you know, he might somebody might say, that's yorn. Instead of saying this is mine, they might say this is mining. So they use like unnecessary <laughs> conjunctions. People might say again instead of against. Like place that, like put that, put that board again, the wall. 
or again the fence instead of against. And then there's a lot of just pronunciation, like instead of light, people will say lot. But it's kind of, it's hard for me to like mimic the West Virginia accent unless I'm talking to somebody that's also kind of playing it up. It's it's hard for me just to just go into it and start talking like it because I feel like I'm not really on it. But sometimes like with my friend, I have a friend that calls me or I call him and we'll answer the phone in, in like these really thick West Virginia accents and, and it's pretty funny. So like he might call me and I'll be like, hey buddy, what you doing? I've been I've been waiting on you call for about two weeks, buddy. You ain't been avoiding me, are you? Let's, get, let's take him dogs up there and go up there up on the mountain and let's hunt, let's hunt some coons up there. Let's, get, let's run them coons out of that mountain. So like that is like when we play it up just joking around sometimes i'll call him and i'll leave like threatening voice messages and in, in like a hillbilly, hillbilly accent when we, when we when we were doing this um vaccine for baby dog or get tested for baby dog crap for covid i, I called him up one day and i left a, a voice message on his phone saying i was uh jim justice's assistant and uh he needed to call me back Hey, buddy, I, I done called you two times and you ain't called me back yet. And I'm going to tell you one more. If I call you one more time and you don't return my call, I'm trying to get in touch with you. Give you this. You got a lifetime supply of Cracker Jack. Ain't, ain't nobody in the world don't want a lifetime supply of Cracker Jacks. So you better give me a call back. And if you don't give me a call back, I'm going to come out here over to where you live over in Beckleworth, Virginia. And I'm going to beat you about half to death. So you better call me back. I'm leaving here at four o'clock. If I ain't got a call from you by 359 i'm driving right down there in beckley i'm gonna beat you by half to death so you just be ready buddy i'm trying to help you but if i can't help you i'm gonna beat you so <laughs> i would leave messages like that over and over again just kind of like messing with him so we kind of play it up that's that's not a really good representation of the west virginia accent but i have a lot of really fond memories of experiences as a child particularly on the rare occasions when my dad could talk me into going hunting with him those were some of the the people that went coon hunting by that point seemed to be like the most hillbilly of hillbillies in our region so it was just like a night of very thick appalachian accents and it was always fun it was always entertaining but i've kind of completely got off the point <laughs> what i think we should do is to show that we're not all speaking with those kind of accents and, and we should never be ashamed of our heritage you know we have a really interesting heritage obviously we're made up a lot of scots irish came here like when the coal mines were booming we were literally getting people from all over the world one of the really interesting things about west virginia is I think our state dish, one of our most popular dishes in the state is a pepperoni roll. And people are like, well, what, why, why is West Virginia, why, why are they so, why are pepperoni rolls so popular there? Why were they invented there? A lot of people, most people say they were invented here. And that's because a lot of the Sicilians, the Sicilian immigrants and the Italian immigrants, they came here to work in the mines and their wives would make them those pepperoni rolls to put in their buckets and take them to work. And so that tradition kind of, you know, spread out i can remember when, in the town i grew up in we had quite a few italian families and that's a little west virginia town a coal coal mining town so the idea that we're all irish or all from the from the british isles uh is is not true there's a lot of italians a lot of eastern europeans that came here a lot of germans a lot of uh, african americans i don't think there are many asians that came over here i guess because we we're just so far from the entry point like san francisco i'm sure there were some but there were a lot of different cultures that kind of came here there's i forget what it's called it's a city named i think it's a polish city and, and they they have like a polish festival every year right in the middle of west virginia but, you know we had a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds come here and work in the mines and like i said a lot of the influence on the appalachian language obviously came from the gaelic languages and and people from the british isles but we had a lot more than that like there were people we had an old woman that owned the shop in the town i grew up in and she would sit there and speak italian you know because she had come from or Sicilian probably. I didn't know the difference at the time, but she sit there and speak Sicilian, which is a different language. Didn't really speak that much English. She was from Sicily, not not like a second generation. She was first generation. And that was, when I was a kid, so that was like in the 80s. So if you imagine going back another 20 years, you'd see a lot more first generation immigrants that came here to work in the mines. And a lot of them were really successful. I think most of the businesses, like uh, the gas station in my hometown growing up was owned by a, an Italian family. One of the bars was... So, I mean, they were really successful when they came to West Virginia, whether they worked in the mines or, or not. Once again, completely off topic. I just think that, you know, we shouldn't shy away from the stereotypes because those stereotypes are always going to be there. You can't argue against a lot of those stereotypes when someone can point them out immediately. You know what I mean? Like if I say, oh, nobody in West Virginia is toothless or 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 incestuous or poor. It's not true. They're 
all of those things are true about certain segments of the population. Thing is, like, so, okay, yeah, some people are like that, but the majority of us are not. And, and that's why I think, like, a campaign like the Mississippi Believe It campaign would be good for West Virginia. Like I said, we have quite a few people that have been successful that have come from the state. And I just think that running a campaign like that could improve, internally improve people's opinion of their home state. And then we kind of move it out. I mean, we have a great slogan, thanks to John Denver, like almost heaven, West Virginia is a great, you know, tourism slogan or whatever you want, wherever you want to slap it. Everybody knows almost heaven, West Virginia. Like it's, it's perfect. So you can put that on everything, every campaign you add or run, every campaign you add, every campaign you run, you just put almost heaven, West Virginia. I remember when I was a kid, they tried to change it a couple of times. It was wild, wonderful West Virginia, which is not bad. And then was something else that was horrible, but almost heaven, West Virginia. It still says wild, wonderful West Virginia in some places, but I'm um, almost heaven. West Virginia is obviously the, the, the one I think they should go with on, on every piece of tourism promotion that they have out there. Just slap it everywhere. I guess that was more of a rant than an actual topic. I just kind of wanted to talk about it. There was a lot of stuff that came out a few weeks ago. Bette Miller was talking smack about West Virginia, saying we're all uneducated and strung out. And then our governor responded in kind. But I think we should acknowledge, number one, we do have a horrible opioid problem. I think worse than any other state in the United States. It's it's horrible. No matter where you go. I, I, I went so I joined the Navy and like I was gone for like eight years. And when I came back it started. It had just started like two well not maybe it had been but it seemed like it was just starting. And then it just got worse. I went to teach overseas in two thousand ten. It was really bad. I went to teach overseas and I just remember coming back like for holidays here and there and just being like, God, everybody's strung out. Like all my friends, not all my friends, but a lot of my friends o- overdosing at like, at that time we were like 29, 30, 31, people overdosing left and right. I, like my hometown is is a ghost town now. It's it's a town pretty much for druggies and, and those that didn't get out pretty much. That's, that's my hometown now. There's no businesses left down there. There's no gas station. There's no grocery store. There's you have to drive 20 miles to, to get groceries, pretty much. And that's sad. That probably would have happened either way because the coal mine shut down. But I'm sure everybody being strung out on pills didn't help. So, I mean, we have to acknowledge that that's one of the issues. And we also have to acknowledge that, yeah, we have a problem with education. But I think coal had a lot to do with that. I've said that a couple of times. Like everybody was like, oh, I can go in the coal mines. I don't have to go to college. And those that did got out. That's why we have a brain drain. That's why it's hard to get people to come into the state because, they, yeah, they can build the company in the state and, and they get tax breaks. But then they have to hire from all over the world because there's not enough people here to support a lot of those jobs. If you're paying relocation fees, for example, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. So um, Virgin came in. They, they built their Hyperloop. Hopefully that won't be the last. I think Jim Justice has done some pretty good things trying to get people to come in. And I think he's done an all right job with tourism. But I think what we need to do is, is you know, not try to pretend that we aren't, we, that we don't have issues. Because we definitely have opioid issues and we definitely have issues with education. We're at the bottom. Like if Mississippi's at the bottom, we're like one spot up. And I think there's, the last one just came out I saw the other day, West Virginia at the bottom of education. It's it's something that really needs to be fixed. And if you pretend it doesn't exist, which is the knee-jerk reaction is to be like, oh, we don't have a problem. But we definitely do. We definitely have a problem, especially with opioids and then education and then job opportunities. All these people that were making one hundred, ten, hundred, twenty thousand dollars a year in the coal mines, most of them don't have jobs anymore or, or they don't have those jobs anymore. You know, that leads to just being depressed man and and getting on drugs taking pills i really hope that they force pfizer and all these other oxycontin producing pharmaceuticals to just pay out massive amounts but i know they won't they'll they'll get out of it somehow they'll pay like three or four billion which sounds big but i mean how many billions did they make off selling them pills to minors man i mean they said that they they had enough pills to overdose like the entire world just in west virginia pretty much it's just ridiculous. But anyway, yeah, this was a, I guess, more of a rant than uh, a topic, an educational topic. But I hope you enjoyed it. It's fun. Always fun talking about my state, even when we're talking about the problems. Uh, hopefully going forward, we're kind of, now that coal is on its way out, there's nothing ever going to bring back coal. And it's, it's kind of crappy for the state in a way. I mean, it's good for the environment, and I understand that. But for years, 
those miners did that job for nothing, literally for nothing for a while. Like I talked about in the first episode, the coal companies made their own money. They call it script. And it was literally worthless outside the coal company. So miners worked for nothing pretty much. And they had crappy salaries for years. The union finally got their salaries to decent levels. And then they got to really good levels in the late 90s, early 2000s. And now nobody used, well, I won't say nobody. The U.S. is definitely shifting away from coal. And that's good for the environment, probably good for the long-term future of the country. But for the state, it's, it's a difficult pill to swallow that we destroyed so much of our natural beauty, ripping out mountains and, and you know, digging believe, below the earth, poisoning rivers. We went through all that. And now when we could actually make money and actually profit and keep some money in the state, now nobody wants it. And then natural gas has gone too. So I, I understand how difficult a pill that is for people to swallow. But, I mean, it is a... Uh, it's a touchy subject, and obviously I have a horse in the race. I'd like to see some of that money that was taken out of the ground come back into the state, but it's it's never going to. But, you know, it is what it is. So thanks for joining me this week. I hope you enjoyed my little rant about my home state. Uh, hopefully I'll have another episode up next week. It won't take um, three weeks for me to make another episode. episode. If not, then I apologize in advance. I do have some stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks I have to take care of, but hopefully I'll make time to sit down here and do another podcast episode. This today, actually, was pretty much shooting from the hip, but I didn't really write anything down. I didn't. Really, I knew I wanted to talk about West Virginia, and that was about it. I thought I'd try it without planning anything out. Maybe all the other episodes sounded like they weren't planned out either, but they at least had some kind of structure. This one was pretty much me just shooting from the hip, so I apologize if, if that wasn't very good. Thanks for joining me. Like I always say, if you want to reach out, you can find us on Twitter at the Hogan Cast. You can send us an email over at thehogancast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're all over. You can find us. Just type in the Hogan Cast and you'll find us. Maybe in the next week or so, we'll try to do another interview like a I mentioned uh, one of my former colleagues, Mr. Gallagher, has mentioned a couple of times that he'd like to be on the the show, be interviewed. If he still feels that way, maybe we'll try to get him on in the next week or so. Until next time, I really appreciate you listening to the Hogan Cast, and I hope you have a great week, weekend, whatever it is. Goodbye. Thank you.